Hi, Clutter Fairy fans. This is the Clutter Fairy Weekly for May 9th, 2023. I'm your co-host, Ed Gumnick, and I'm speaking with Gail Goddard, certified professional organizer and owner of the Clutter Fairy in Houston, Texas. Hi, everybody. The Clutter Fairy Weekly is the webcast and podcast that digs deep into the clutter that piles up between you and the life you want to be living. We explore the habits and behaviors that lead to clutter, and we suggest strategies to slow the accumulation, reduce the collection, and comfortably manage the stuff we decide to keep. If you're new to our Zoom meeting, we'd like to let you know that you can share your comments and questions via the chat feature, and I'll try to make sure Gail addresses them before we move on to another topic. You can also use the raise hand feature if you'd like to ask a question or make a comment yourself via audio or video. We're also streaming the webcast live on Facebook, so you can share your questions and comments there, and I'll relay them to Gail. We're going to start by recapping last week's weekly tittle, which was called, What's My Motivation? The assignment was to take a deeper dive into the reasons you've expressed for wanting to declutter and get organized. Let's hear from our participants in Zoom and on Facebook. Who worked the tittle this week? Please let us know in the comments. Frequent participant Anita, who is here with us today, shared her inspiration. Anita wrote, I keep thinking that if I could just get all the photos and memorabilia out of the basement, I could finish turning it into a dance practice slash guest room space. She goes on to say, I have this fantasy where when the room is finished and decorated with floor to ceiling drapes covering the necessary storage shelves on two walls and mirrors on a third, I invite another couple over to dance with us after dinner. Be still my heart. <laughs> I'm so impressed by this response. Uh, Anita has a clear, specific vision for how she'd uh, prefer to use her basement, not as a storage space for mementos, but as a dance studio. And she has the outline of the project plan too: clear the photos and memorabilia, install the shelving, add drapes and mirrors, so on. By imagining the new use for her basement in so much detail, she's setting herself up for excess, uh, success in achieving that goal. And it's such a fun vision, too. I love the idea of dancing with friends in the basement after dinner. That totally sounds like a ball. So um, <clears throat> I hope that you stay on it, Anita, and, and just consider this um, enforced rest by your knee injury is helping you accomplish this goal. And so that's a good thing to go for. You have time to sit there and look at all those photos because you got to recover anyway. And you're going to be up and dancing in no time in your new studio. So we're holding the space for you. Go team, go. <laughs> uh, M reports, I started the tittle by doing the first survey on motivation. As for decluttering, I made big product progress clearing the hallway, having decided that hallways are not storage areas. Exactly. I'm so proud of you because they are not. <laughs> <laughs> and we're just restricting our ability to walk down them when they're full of stuff. So good for you. Um, it is an open floor space and lots of people grab it and put stuff in it. But once you start that, it's a slippery slope to making a wall of things that means you can't get down the hall. So good for you for changing your mind and thinking of it differently and making some changes around it. Excellent. Samudra says, I started the survey, but got, but got stuck on the first question. 20 minutes later, I did something else. You know, we're trying to make our surveys challenging <laughs> and thought provoking, and maybe we made that one just a little too challenging and thought provoking. <laughs> well, and you can always skip it. If you, yes. if you feel like you don't have a response, you can skip it and move on to the next question. Yeah, That's all, okay. <laughs> in, in, in case that wasn't obvious, all of the questions except one on all of our surveys are optional you never have to answer a question to go on the only one that you have to answer is can we use you know the one that re regards whether or not we can use what you've said to us because we don't want to quote anyone who doesn't want to be quoted right Sumudra, let's, <laughs> Sumudra, Sumudra has a rebuttal I keep forgetting to do the survey I keep remembering on Sunday night and getting about halfway through and then going and I get something shiny goes by and that's, it. <laughs> <laughs> that's okay. Your half done survey is still helpful. So don't worry about it. <laughs> There's no grades here at the Clutter Fairy. We're not passing out grades. <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> that's hilarious. Tammy shared, my motivation is to feel peace and calm, to feel safe, secure, and stable, to feel organized and functional, to have company. 
Maybe invite my family if we all heal trauma to have dance and joy. Show and tells I've led for others to feel joy and safe for myself. That's awesome. That's a great vision. That's a great motivation to be able to feel safe there and to feel like you can have people over and have your family come and visit. That would be awesome. So we're going to hold that space for you as well. That's a great motivation. It's a very positive and affirming one. And it's very um, rooted in self-care. You're thinking about all the things that are going to be helpful for you in your own care. And I think that's really great. So hold that vision for yourself. It's a good one. Marsh says, right now it is in the dirty details in my home to visualize how my home and life will become. Uh, she said, very freedom. And I'm wondering if she meant very freeing or maybe it was an autocorrect error. I get a lot of those. <laughs> right. Michelle says, I didn't do the tittle as I spent the week in Halkadiki. I don't know where that is, but it sounds, Ooh. it sounds like it could be Greek. It sounds foreign. <laughs> and she says, but I have- interesting." But I have managed to unpack the suitcases, put everything away, and got a start on the laundry. Woo! Hey, that's a win. Hey, that is a win. And Marsh says, yes, freeing was the word she was going for. And I apparently got it right on Greece. Good guess. Oh, good guess. Excellent. Oh, I bet it was wonderful. I bet that was a fabulous trip. I hope you enjoyed yourself immensely. Claire, who's with us on Facebook, says, I now have a bag on the landing in my home and everyone is encouraged to put their giveaways for the charity shop straight into the bag. Every Monday I get on the bus and take the bag direct to the shop. It's really motivating. Now I have a regular habit of getting the, declu the declutter out of the house. Hurrah. Hurrah is right. And <clears throat> one bag on the bus is something that you can manage, right? Like if you skipped it for a month and then had four bags of stuff, it would be much harder task for you to do and much less pleasant. And so you've created a habit and a process that makes it easy to do and makes it repetitive. And every week stuff goes out of the house and you can pick up the bag and walk with it to the bus stop and get on the bus and manage it. And it's not a hassle. And so good for you. Like that is a great habit to have. <clears throat> and eventually you'll run out of stuff. And won't that be a shocker? <laughs> good job. Ginger shared. I have the vision. I've identified a lot of things to go. I simply have so much going on right now that I feel overwhelmed. So I need some muscle to remove stuff as I pointed out. Going to hire the kid next door to climb in cabinets for me. That's a great idea. You know, any help will be useful. And if they're climbing around up in there, then that's just one. Then you do all the decision making and they do all the physical labor. And that's excellent. That's the way to do it. <clears throat> I'm glad you recruited support for yourself. That's excellent. Okay, I think we should get on with our main topic. Okay. <clears throat> Many people come to decluttering late in life, addressing the accumulation of stuff only after it's been piling up for decades. But it's never too soon or too late to get organized. Today, we're going to talk about how people of almost any age benefit from a clear, clutter-free home. Thank you to Jean for suggesting this topic. Uh, let's kick off this conversation by looking at some of the survey results. We asked our audience to tell us about a memory of a person or an incident from their formative years of life that influenced their attitudes and emotions about belongings and clutter and so on. Let's talk about a few of those responses that we got. Joanna said, my grandparents lead a simple life and were masters of reusing, repurposing, DIY and keeping their home organized. They had less things, but they were of good quality and I still use their towels and linens. My parents, on the other hand, were almost hoarders. They had a huge house, so it wasn't immediately noticeable to others, but cleaning out of their house was a nightmare. I strive for my grandparents' way of life, but have a hard time shaking the keep everything attitude my parents modeled when I was little. Our parents definitely model behavior for us as kids. We absorb their emotion about something too. Um, it, whatever emotion that your parents are radiating, you're absorbing them. It makes an imprint on us. And sometimes that's hard to shake off. It's important to be conscious that you learn this attitude from parents when you were young and malleable <laughs> without the ability to fair, uh, fairly evaluate something that's been given to you. That's why it's so sticky. As adults and masters, masters of our own minds, we can be conscious of our responses that seem like inherited ones and examine them as to whether we want to keep them as our own or not. 
Just because our parents modeled it doesn't mean we have to act in the same manner. We can teach ourselves a new way and a new response. It is a struggle uh, to A, recognize that the way that you're feeling was an inherited process, an inherited reaction. thought path, yeah. reaction, exactly. And <clears throat> the first thing is recognizing that it's not really you. <laughs> it's not really how you feel about it. It's how your parents felt about it. And, and then the second thing is I'm trying to swim upstream against it. Um, it it requires getting some steam and it requires some practice to do it in a different way. Think about it in a different way. And it's worth the effort. If you find that what your parents gave you and the responses that your parents modeled for you are not really supporting you or not successful for you, then <clears throat> it's worth the effort to try to undo that automatic response and bake in a new one and coming to the clutter fairy weekly is one of the ways you can do that we're talking about um, ways to be organized all the time and this is where you can learn something different and we hope that you are able to adjust we want you to not feel trapped by the messages that your parents said around this an anonymous user said, when I was growing up, the house was clean and uncluttered. My father kept his clutter elsewhere, so I never saw it or knew about it, but nobody taught me how to organize my stuff. And if you aren't taught some basic skills for stuff management, it leaves you with a deficit for sure, but that's why you're here to learn some organizing skills. We can all learn, even if we don't become experts at it, it doesn't really matter, we can still seek out and practice new skills to help us fill in what we missed learning as kids. There's no need to give up because your parents didn't model it for you. It's just one of the things you get to learn for yourself. And we all have things like that. Um, you know, didn't learn how to cook. Don't really want to learn how to cook. So <laughs> that's not one that I'm trying to put effort into change because I can cope other ways. But <clears throat> if not being organized is a bother for you, then, um, even if your parents didn't teach you and yeah, we can resent them for that or be sad about that. And, it, but it's worth the time to try to learn it as an adult is my point. It, that was, a, I thought that was a really interesting response because it, it highlighted that you can't uh, you know, if you hide what you're doing from your children, if you, if you do it all behind the scenes, then there are lessons that they're, they're missing out on. Yeah. They're not catching cause he was hiding it all. And it's just one of the ways in which they miss the opportunity to teach. Yeah. And, and I'm sure you learned a whole bunch of other things from your parents, but you know, nobody gets a hundred percent of everything they need from their parents, even though the parents would wish it. Um, they don't have all the skills to teach you. And so there's always going to be something. And if for you, it's that you didn't have organizing skills, then you just get to learn them as an adult. That's all it's out there. We can teach you. It can be done. You can learn. Kathy says, my mom was a clean freak and our huge farmhouse was nearly spotless. My dad's family were all hoarders, so much so that they actually stored stuff at our house, much to my mom's dismay. They got one room and over the years, it slowly disappeared with mom's annual spring sorting and cleaning. <laughs> like, I love that she slowly emptied the room quietly every spring by, you know, making things disappear. And it's not unusual that people who are hoarders and store a lot of stuff, they run out of their spaces and they start co-opting other spaces around them. And it so spills into yours. Yeah. It's not unusual. And if that's the truth for you, you have to hold a really hard line. Like, yeah, just because I have space doesn't mean you get to fill it and no. And it sounds like the mom in this situation designated a room and let them put stuff in it and then slowly made it go away, <laughs> which I thought was, you know, that was her um, quiet way to reclaim her house the way that it, she wanted it. <clears throat> I'm sure it was as the father in this scenario who was living in the clean house instead of living in the hoarding house. I'm sure he felt like he won the jackpot when he married a woman who was clean and managed their house and kept their house clean. It must've been such a relief to him after living in a space that was chaotic all the time. He won the jackpot on that one. Sandra says, my father grew up during the depression. I remember my grandmother and mother saying, use it up, wear it out, make it do or do without. 
and a penny saved is a penny earned. Those are very famous um, quotes from that time period for sure. A lot of people on our survey mentioned the depression that their parents who grew up poor or they mentioned growing up poor themselves. Those who lived through that life-threatening situation were certainly affected by it. It was a great trauma for everyone and it left a lasting impression on many generations. Uh, I've said before that the kids who lived through it didn't have the emotional understanding about what was happening and they didn't know that it wouldn't last forever. That emotional experience as kids then made adults who were very fearful about loss and lack. They in turn raised their children by modeling that fear of lack and scarcity. And fear of scarcity drove several generations after the depression. And some are just now far enough away to let it go. If you're still saving too much stuff to manage out of a fear of scarcity, it's a good time to examine the truth of that belief and see if you can modify those beliefs to something that's less fearful um, and less and a less accumulative belief. It's amazing to me how long, how far reaching the effects, the emotional effects of the depression have been over the generations and how I still have clients who say to me, my parents grew up in the depression. Now, these people are seniors. I'm talking to seniors who are talking about their parents being kids during the depression. So we're starting to run out of the generation that was directly affected and also the kids of the kids. And so um, we're we're getting some removed from that experience at least, but it, it has affected people for a long time. And I think most particularly the kids that lived through it taught their kids to be afraid and we're, we're struggling to let go of that. Well, and, and since the depression, we had, the the economic boom after the war and mm. then and then the onslaught of massive amounts of cheap mostly plastic consumer goods right and so you know living in ha, holding on to a i have to keep everything attitude when much of what you've bought was cheap stuff from big box stores just doesn't just doesn't work um, yeah, they they don't dovetail very well, do they? Yeah, and it created it, it did create kind of a tsunami <laughs> of, of stuff around which all kinds of um you know like the public storage system was born around that having storage units right as a direct result of having that um, boom in easily affordable consumer goods and so <clears throat> we're we're still suffering the effects it but like I said it's getting easier and if your parents were parents that modeled um, fear of scarcity, you can acknowledge that that's what they modeled for you out of their fear and that you can decide to see it differently. You can decide to change how you feel about it and come up with something that's more comfortable and affirming for you and less stressful so that you don't have to have so much stuff to do, so much stuff to manage. Connie mentioned (laughs) also the advertising making you feel insecure until you buy something. And so, you know, a, a, a lot of people f- find themselves with, you know, two two different kinds of fear driving them. Mm. Fear that you you won't have the ideal life if you don't get the stuff they're trying to sell you. And then <laughs> right. also fear of letting go of everything you've already accumulated. Right. Yeah. That's, a, you know, a situation designed to make you have too much stuff in your house. Yeah, just keep remembering that the advertising is not thinking about the quality of living that you have at your house. The advertising is only thinking about getting money out of your pocket. Yes. Okay, Ginger says, my aunt and I were always working together to declutter and organize her home. We bought and read all the organizing books and I've kept those books. Her home wasn't a cluttered mess, but she was forever reorganizing things. She did Con Marie folding before Marie Kondo was born. (laughs) I love that so much. She's like, my mom did it before. My aunt did it before. It was cool. I think that's awesome. And she sounds like somebody for whom organizing was soothing and a stress reliever. I find that to be true myself. When I'm stressed by something, heading to a client and straightening out a space is really relaxing to me. Your mom was just doing what, I mean, your aunt was just doing what gave her stress relief. She was in there moving the stuff around and, and 
resetting it and putting it back together again in a way that felt organized to her. And I'm sure that that was in, it, it was as much soothing her mind as it was um, actually affecting the physical space. And how great that you guys got to spend time together doing that. That was wonderful. She was trying to teach you, wasn't she? Summer says, I had the exhaustive and draining experience of cleaning out my parents' lifelong home. It impressed on me how unfair it is to leave it to your heirs. And we've had this conversation so many times. Um, if you inherit a lifelong home that has never been cleared out, that's only been added to, that's been stuffed until it was super dense, then undoing, unwinding that life, unwinding that representation of your parents' life is a massive project that takes so much effort and energy and it's exhausting and it's miserable because you're doing it because of the losses that you've suffered and having to do a huge project that is annoying and draining while you're sad and in grief or sometime after, you know, sometimes we get the, the added benefit of we can wait a little while before we do it. But a lot of times it has to be done relatively quickly. And <clears throat> it is such a project to unwind somebody's whole life. And so it is a big burden to leave behind for somebody else to do. And can be, it's a good motivation to try to not do that for your family to not leave it for them. We, a, a lot of people responded in that vein. So it's, it's nice to know that our audience is thinking about that, paying attention to who's going to have to deal with it for them if they don't deal with it themselves. Well, and you know, e even if you haven't ever thought about it, then suddenly you have to do it. Like as once you do it one time, you never forget how hard a, a project it was and how much work it took. And, you know, sometimes people call me in to help. And I go in and, and do the work, bring a team, clean it out, hire the movers, hire the auction house. You know, I do all that work and it takes months, depending on how much time they have to dedicate, you know, like I can go in and start working on it, but if they want to participate at all, then I have to, it, it's based on their schedule and their availability. And so um, I can come and do all that work, but then it, you know, it costs a bunch of money because it takes a lot of time. It takes a lot of time and many hours of work to get it done. And so you can hire that help and it's going to cost you money. And if you don't hire the help and you have to do it yourself, then you're going to be exhausted. And so <laughs> it is um, it is something to strive to minimize as much as you can for your heirs. Are we ready to go to the next phase? I think so. You got all the questions. Okay. So we're going to, we're, going to talk about how organizing helps all along the, the way a, a clear living space means a more peaceful living to me but there are many reasons why having less stuff and more space is helpful to anyone at any age since ed referenced cradle in this week's title the in the title of the show then let's start there at the beginning um so infants and toddlers and children are what i'm talking about first Anyone who's taking care of a child who is not operating under their own steam or is barely in motion knows you're doing everything for them in, up into and including poop management. That requires a lot of supplies to keep the child clean and healthy. On top of that, kids are spontaneous and impulsive and they have no emotional control. In other words, they're completely unpredictable. The only way to cope with that little squirming, screaming child with no impulse control is to be ready to react to anything that they throw at you. Since the kid has no plan for their every waking moment, you need a plan instead. An organized kid's bedroom and bathroom stocked with all the supplies you'll need that in order to deal with whatever they're throwing down at you will help any parent stay sane. An organized go bag means you can cope when you and the kid are on the road away from home. Lots of people carry a well-stocked diaper bag back early on when they're trying to get the kid in motion and moving around the world. They need that go bag to cope out there. And having that be an organized bag just makes that much easier for you as a parent. A playroom that gets reset and the playroom volume of toys that gets managed helps the kids avoid being overwhelmed. Those little undeveloped brains have way less ability to deal with too many choices and chaos than you do. 
And keeping the playroom reset and stocked with a low volume of items means the kids aren't overwhelmed in their own playroom. Any kid that is going to be overwhelmed is going to leave it chaotic. They're going to add to the chaos and then they're going to stay out of the room just like you do. When people talk about, I can't go in my craft room anymore, it's too overwhelming. So the kid's playroom that's out of control is the little kid's version of that process. They can't go in the playroom anymore when it's too insane. Or they go in and they don't have as much fun or they can't use all the toys because they're just overwhelmed. They're overstimulated with how much stuff is in there. And they have less functioning brains than you do to deal with it. <laughs> they haven't developed all of the uh, mechanisms that would help them manage uh, being in that chaotic environment. And so managing that playroom for them just makes their life in the house easier. Keeping the kid's closet um, organized is going to help anybody that's in charge of getting a kid dressed and out the door from grandma all the way to the babysitter, turning the clothing contents based on size and wear as they outgrow them and destroy them while they're wearing them gives anyone that's putting up laundry an easier time. And anyone that's going to dress the kid has an easier time too. If they can get into the closet, they can find stuff that's clean. They can um, access it easily and put it away easily when it's um, washed and dried. These, this all makes dressing the kid every morning that much easier. Next, after all those little small kids, you get into teenagers and young adults. So children that are now moving under their own power and they're in school means they've got homework, deadlines, sports practice, club activities, and general running around to do. They might even have a job at this stage, depending on um, what the what their te what the teenager young adult is going to do besides school. These kids need a clear surface to study effectively and organizing their study space, their study spot, table, desk, whatever it is, is only going to make their life easier. It's going to make them easy to study. A room that's organized limits those distractions as well. So those of you who have said to me, you know, I find the clutter visually distracting, visually upsetting. If you as an adult find it visually overstimulating or distressing or distracting, imagine a teenager that's in a room that's trying to focus on math and they're in a room that's in chaos and it's going to distract them and it's going to be anxiety producing and it's going to be make it harder for them to stay focused. And so organizing that room so that it doesn't have chaotic mess that is going to be distracting from studying only helps them be better students right um, every teenager young adult can use training about how to manage their schedule and balance their schoolwork with other activities if they get the hang of tracking their own schedule it means that you've got less disruption in the regular routine and many less fire drills for the parents trying to deal with something the kid forgot there's always something on the calendar that, that is like, oh yeah, I, it's like 10 o'clock at night. I need to do X, Y, Z tomorrow at morning at eight o'clock. Like there's always something that slips by, but training that teenager and young adult to manage their own schedule and make sure that they're aware and that you're aware of what they need to be doing um, only helps them manage their life and stay calmer and less stressed out, right? Everybody's calmer if they can manage their schedule. So this is a good time. That organizational process makes them more productive, makes it easier for them to cope, and it's worth it. Um, a collective family calendar that's accessible and updated by everyone helps the whole family manage their schedules. Um, it prevents double booking, and it points out the areas where the chauffeur, i.e. the parents, will be driving, will have uh, driving time issues trying to get to several events in a day. Anything that supports the parents' drive schedule helps them manage the family. Um, when the kids are teenagers and young adults, they're in so many activities and they have so many places to be and they may or may not be at driving age and or they may be driving but not have their own car, blah, blah, blah. So um, there's still a lot of driving that has to happen. And when there's more than one kid and parents have things to do too, there's a, a lot of planning that goes in getting everywhere getting everyone everywhere they need to be when they need to be and, and still being able to go pick up the sister, right? <laughs> like you can't leave the other kids behind. So <clears throat> there's a lot of management that goes into that. And it's a very productive thing for a family to have a big family calendar that is centrally located in the kitchen somewhere that everybody can see 
and make sure that they all put their events on it so that you have some warning if there's double booking going on or you got to get another chauffeur involved or there's you know there's conflicts that are happening so um being organized around the calendar makes everybody's life easier let me share a comment from m okay m says my mother did the decluttering for us passing on our clothing for example therefore we never learn how to make the decluttering decisions ourselves what yeah. uh what's your experience i i you've 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 worked mostly with older adults but have you seen any of your clients training their kids in uh, well so the thing about when you start being a mom the infant is not able to make their own decisions right like there's a point until the kids sort of become aware of stuff and can say that's mine um, they don't really have an opinion about what gets what stays and what goes so the parents sort of start out with the habit of doing the decluttering for them and um, when the kids start resisting uh, oftentimes parents then loop them in on trying to make some decisions talking to them about it but if you know if you just start out decluttering for them and you just keep keep on that habit and you never pause to think hey i need to you know i need to ask their opinions I need to find out what they think is important. I need to find out what is their favorites. Uh, and moms always think they know what the kids' favorites are. And so they sort of edit based on what they believe the kid believes. <laughs> but um, oftentimes they're not right. And if they never get into the habit of doing, of coaching them about it, then when I get called in, it's because my kids won't blah, blah, blah. Well, yeah, so we got to stop and teach them that. Like, it's not, if you missed it, if you miss teaching them, then we have to teach them. And that's fine. They can learn. And I guess people sort of make the assumption that because their parents didn't teach them, they can't, therefore they will never learn. They will never know. It's like, no, it's not true. <laughs> you can learn it. Just because mom uh, thought it was easier and faster to do the cluttering for you than to loop you in and get your opinion. Or she would do it while you were at school so that you wouldn't, she didn't have to like bother with what you thought fight, about it like fight that battle <laughs> yeah like some people was like it's not worth the battle i'm just going to remove it while they're gone and i always say no they're just going to be in therapy about that later <laughs> like, well, you don't understand we, how much that scars people to throw yeah, things away without their permission and we see that a lot <laughs> a lot of people have have commented about a specific thing from their childhood that disappeared one day Right. Well, and then the one lady told a story. I can't remember the name. I'm sorry, but she said that they were decluttering the stuffed animals together, the mom and the and the child. And the mom, he wanted to declutter a specific little monkey toy. And the mom wouldn't let that one go because she had memories of that toy. So she made that one stay. But then she got rid of the kid's favorite stuffed animal instead. Like the trade out was they kept the one that mom liked and they got rid of the one the kid liked. And I was like, no, this is like <laughs> now this person is telling this story as a grown adult. And they're telling me about that wound and how much they cried about losing that bear. It's like, why would you choose the one that you like and not the one that kids like that? That was super disrespectful to me. And and it's part of what parents are like, yeah, I don't have time for what you care about. I got to get this done. And, you know, they're trying to manage the stuff, but in doing so, they don't stop long enough to go, okay, what's your favorite? Oh, you don't like the monkey, but I like the monkey. Okay. So then you go take the monkey and put it in your keepsakes and don't make the kid give up something that they like. Yeah. That was crazy. So sometimes we don't, we don't teach the right thing, <laughs> but, but ultimately if they're not, looping the kids in at some point then the kid is going to be in my show later learning how to declutter <laughs> from listening to me talk about it instead and and there's going to be some level of scarring that happens like you don't realize that you think you know what the person finds valuable but i know from vast experience i never make a judgment about i never make a judgment about what is important to somebody because that little piece of paper with a little scribble handwriting on it that looks torn out of a thing that looks like trash to me is really the last note that the mother wrote to the person before they died. And you, you, you just can't, you can't judge how 
what the value is of something to someone um, if you are not that person. So it's same goes true for parents and their kids. You think you know what your kid is into. And a lot of times you're probably right, but you will be surprised when you ask the question, do you want to keep the bear or the monkey? And the answer is going to be the bear. And, and she should have honored that. And I'm, you know, I have a little resentment about her on behalf of that person who is now telling it like, you know, you're a grown adult telling me this story about this scar. And I'm sure that there was a reason why your mom went down that path. But I think you have to like forgive and forget, make your own choices, you know, know that you're in command of your own choices now and no one is going to take away stuff that you want because you're the one making the choices now. So we forget that, you know, mom isn't going to swoop in in our 60s and, and still and and still come and take things away from us without us knowing about it. It's not going to happen anymore. So um, we can live in a new space. We can let that little kid have that experience and we can be in a different place instead. Okay. One more quick thing before you go on. <laughs> Margaret okay. said, Margaret mentioned, um, this is sort of connected to the shared family calendar. A centrally located family shopping list also helps. Oh, everyone, very good point. Everyone knows if they need it, put it on the list. That's a great idea. Cause that way, you know, you're, you don't have somebody going, mom, I need blah, 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 blah. You can just say, put it on the list. And so that they, if they get into that habit, then they don't, they don't come running to you to yell about it. They just go and put it on the list. And what a great idea. You don't have to buy everything they put on the list. Right. Like if you put 500 toys on the list, you can ignore it, but you can, um, you know, also notice, oh, somebody's out of, to uh, out of toothpaste or whatever. And you can, you can manage it for them that way. That's excellent. Okay. So um, the next category of life we're going to talk about is being a single adult. So you're a new adult in a new space and living alone for the first time. It might be college or a, your first apartment where you're living alone. Um, there's nothing like being removed from the parents to find out what skills you have and what skills you don't have. <laughs> being in charge for the first time of your environment shows how much uh, your mom was doing for you and how much they're, um, how much you're having to take over for the first time as you go into that new space. If you look around the new space and you don't like how it looks and you think it looks a little chaotic and dirty and whatever, then surprise, surprise, uh, people were supporting you at home where you used to live and uh, the maid did not come with you. So you get to learn <laughs> at this point. And, and usually this is the first time that people figure out, oh, this is where I have deficits in skill. I don't know how to do the laundry. I don't know how to clean the bathtub. I don't know how to what, fill in the blank, right? I don't know how to cook something. So um, this is where you uh, start experiencing all the ways in which you have been taken care of and not managing your own self. And then what you need to put on your list of things to start learning. Married couples are um, a next level of category. <laughs> um, so now you're learning to live around each other for the first time. And later when the kids come along, it's also means being organized can only help you live your life. It's being married splits up the duties. It share you share the workload, and you can create routines that make your life run smoothly. This is the time when people do things like, "I'll do the vacuuming and you load the dishwasher. I will pay the bills and you can handle the mail." Like you, you sort of go through that process of divvying up who's going to do what. And um, if anybody's list is super one sided, yeah, we, we need to circle back and try again. <laughs> Nobody needs to put everything on one person. So being organized as a, as a couple and sharing, sharing the management of the household, the organizing of the household, uh, the processing of what's coming into the household, this is how you learn to organize together and work together towards the mutual goal of, I want this house to run smoothly. I don't want it to be stressful for everybody. This is our place to be home together and comfortable and happy. And we all participate. And yes, I can tell your husband that. <laughs> I just saw that pop up in the corner over there. <laughs> um, it's it's an important thing to do as married couples is to share, this, share the organization of the space and it makes a big difference if you do it together. Then those married couples add kids. <laughs> And now that you've added some Tasmanian devils into the mix, they're present in your life solely to create chaos. Anybody with kids knows that families are organized 
families that are already organized, they run more smoothly and with less stress for everyone than the families that struggle with being organized. Many humans require a lot of care. It takes all of those 20 years to become a viable adult. And being organized while you spend those 20 years only makes the journey easier for everyone. So it's worth the effort to, um, even if you have been lax about it up to this point, um, making a family with children run more smoothly makes everybody in the household happier. And spending the time to add in those skills to learn to be organized, to learn things that help the family be more organized only makes everything about living together easier on everyone. You can manage time, you can manage space, you can manage care, and all of those things will make your family life more enjoyable and less stressful. And so be nice to your mother <laughs> and, and participate in making it better for everyone. Then we get to middle-aged adults. So those of us at this stage in life are about to inherit a whole household full of stuff for mom and dad. Too bad it's when you're the least prepared to cope with it. Having your house organized before this happens, your own house organized before you receive everything from your parents, and helps you receive what you want from an estate clearing and be able to absorb it. We also have the most responsibilities at this point in our life. Uh, the most responsibilities at work, the most responsibilities around our hobbies because we've been doing them for a while. Um, we're dealing with adult children who may have moved out, but they still need support and help. It's a time with a lot of burdens to manage and organizing to support all those functions in your life helps with stress relief. You're the person who benefits the most from, or from your organizing skills during this phase of life. And lots of people have adult children that still need help, they have parents that are need care or uh, management. You're starting to take over um, the financial responsibility for your parents. You're starting to manage their bills. Maybe you're starting to run errands for them. You're starting to, you know, care for them because they can't do it all themselves. So you're like helping grown kids. You're helping your parents and you're in the middle with the most um, you're at that peak moment of your career when you have the most responsibilities at your work. And so you have a lot on your plate. And anything being organized can only help all those things be function better and be more manageable for you. This, this too shall pass. The adult children get older and they learn more and take care of themselves more. Um, the parents' care will not last forever and you will eventually be on the other side of it. But during this time period, you're going to have a lot of demands for your attention and being organized around that can only make you navigate this easier. It's only going to help you and not be completely destroyed, right? And then we get to the last. The last one is now you're a senior. You're officially a senior. Maybe you're retired and maybe you're well past retirement. And for seniors, being organized is all about being safe and healthy in your own space. Being able to navigate safely around the house as you age and that you lose some mobility is so helpful. Being able to manage your own home contents and keep the house clean is also directly related to how healthy you stay in the house. The less stuff you have to manage, the easier that cleaning and management becomes, and the less stressful and less hard on your own body it is. Organizing also helps you pass your belongings to the next generation in a responsible manner, uh, not overburdening them with a huge project to deal with after you're gone. This is really the last gift you can give your family. It's a, an organized, manageable space to inherit. My mom did it and, and and I had helped her in the last years of her life work on some projects when I would go out at Christmas time, we would work in some area together. And um, my sister and I were so grateful for it as we cleared out her house. Um, I have a very distinct memory of being in my mother's kitchen and um, it was the a few days right after she had died. And my brother-in-law came over to the house and he started walking through the kitchen and he was opening cabinets and he kept opening them and staring at them and closing them again. He would go to the next one, open it and stare at it and close it. And I finally looked at him. I was like, what are you doing right now? He was like, I'm assessing the project. <laughs> like He was trying to find out how dense it was and how, um, how much work it was going to be to clear out the house. And I think he was pleasantly surprised that the cabinets were not stuff to the gills. It was not super overwhelming. She had done a lot of work and, and it had already taken many, many things that she had inherited out of the house. She'd already gotten rid of lots of stuff that she didn't want or use. 
and her house was full with the things that she found valuable that she used all the time that she really loved and so it was an effort to get her house empty but it was not terrible it was not overwhelming and it was a project that between my sister and I we could make happen and I was really grateful for that it was it was a gift that she gave me that intellectually I knew was going to be useful but when I was my own client I did a show about that back when it happened when I was my own client I was super grateful for all the things that she had done and I could tell all the things she had done to make it easier for me and I really appreciated it seniors need to be organized to be healthy and they need to be organized to make it easier on their um, descendants and um, I've lived that and I'm super grateful for it and I hope that you can be organized around that stuff too we want you wherever you are in that age list of uh, wherever you are in your living stages of that list um, we hope that you will consider improving that organization to be in support of yourself to make your life and what's going on in your life at that time easier and better Okay, I want to share some more comments, but first, let's talk about next week. Okay. We get a lot of cries for help from people who struggle to organize photos, family heirlooms, and other priceless, I'm putting that in quotation marks, memorabilia. Next week, we're going to revisit how to corral these challenging categories of sentimental stuff. Join us on May 16th, 2023, at the usual time, noon U.S. Central, for irreplaceable Managing Family Photos, Heirlooms, and Memorabilia. Let me share a comment. There were, there were lots and lots of comments in the Zoom chat uh, about things that parents gave away. Only one uh, jumps out at me where Paula said, I can't think of a single thing of mine that my parents threw away. Guess I hit the jackpot with them. You totally did. Oh my gosh, you should... Call your mother and thank her right now. And if she's deceased, you should say a prayer out loud to her and tell her thank you. <laughs> That's awesome, man. Michelle says, in the 90s, my mom hated my biker boots. They vanished one summer and I have always been miffed about it. Maybe that's why I have so many shoes. <laughs> See, you never know what's going to make you mad. <laughs> Well, and, and stick and, with you forever. Yeah, and it, I mean, it's clear that uh, that a lot of uh, a lot of people participating right now have have some trauma um, about things that were given Disapp away, Disapp disappeared, given away without permission. Um, Lynn also mentioned twice a year as a child we had to try on our clothes and pass outgrown clothes on to cousins. I didn't like doing that, and now avoid working with my own clothes. So if there's an other, a different way that you could process your clothes, um, be happy to do it. Um, I wonder if part of the reason that it was hard for the, at the time was because it probably took some time to go through and, and try everything on. Like she did it all in one sitting. If she did it twice a year, I mean, now that's a reasonable amount of time. Okay. Now there's been six more months of growth. And the seasons, two seasons have gone by and, and how, how does that stuff fit now? It was an annoying chore, but your mother was trying to manage your closet, right? Like she was trying to make it easier for you to use your closet for her to put stuff away. Like it was, it was in service to um, supporting the cousins and making your um, closet function better. So maybe you just have to think about it from like your emotional response right now is is rested in what was annoying about it as a kid and how you felt about doing it as a kid. But maybe you just have to stop and think about it objectively for a little while and say, yes, I was annoyed as a kid, but as an adult, I can stand in my mother's shoes and recognize that um, what was she, she was trying to accomplish something there. She was trying to organize my room for me. She was trying to make the closet work better. She was trying to make it easier for her to do the laundry and put our clothes away. And there was a reason for that. And it was helpful. And maybe the cousins, um, you might ask if the cousins, was it, were, were they in a different financial position? Was this her way of supporting her uh, relatives? She was giving things away to siblings, the kids of siblings. And 
she was trying to be supportive of her own family. Like <clears throat> you can recognize that as a kid, it was annoying, but you can also evaluate what your mother was doing objectively and try to understand her and understand what she was doing and, and all of the ways that she was trying to support your family and another family in that process and, and maybe give her a little bit of a pass about it. Or even if you can't, <clears throat> even if you can't do that, you can get in touch with your own reasons for, for doing it mm -hmm. to make, to make room for new stuff, to, to um, get it, make it easier to get dressed in the morning, to make yeah. it easier to put the laundry up, like make it easier to manage, mm. um, give things away to people who need it more, more than you do. Yeah. Anya you says, my stepmom gave my favorite sweater, which she didn't like me wearing to our cat to get to get her kittens in when I was about 14. I was very badly upset about that. Yeah, that's pretty passive aggressive, too. Yeah, <laughs> it's like, yeah, I don't want you to wear this. So we're going to let the cat birth on these. That's that's uh, Oof, yeah. 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 See, that's like that's just. That was petty. I'm sorry. That was petty of your stepmother to do. That was very um, that was very tacky. And these are the things that you that make you sad. Right. These are the things that feel like violations because they are. And. It's one thing to have that violation and experience it and be sad about it and it's another thing to let that violation negatively impact you forever so you can honor the sadness or and the loss and maybe process about do some uh, emotional work some therapy work some some journaling work do something around the loss itself and and dealing with the emotion of the loss but it's important to not let that loss then drive all of your future behavior. If what it if what it does is sabotage your own living environment and sabotage your own ability to cope. And so um, you don't want to be overreactionary because once you lost your favorite sweater, it is something that's sad and and it, and and it speaks to, you know, the relationship between stepmoms and stepdaughters, <laughs> and and what needs to be processed there for you. But in terms of practically managing your own life, you don't want that. You don't want your own management to be colored forever by that loss so that you don't do things that are supportive of you now, right? Like the little kid got hurt by that. The teenager got hurt by that. But now you're trying to take care of your life and manage your stuff and have it be pleasant for you and have it be in service to what you want to do and how you want to live right now. And you don't want all of that stuff to be sabotaged by you still reacting to the loss. So I think it's important to process that loss and, and get some healing around it in some way. And then consciously, objectively try to separate how you feel about that loss from your choices about how you manage your space and your stuff now. Because the person that's going to benefit or not benefit from any organizing that you do is you. It's always your own support that you're sabotaging by reacting to that kind of loss still, like letting that loss still drive your choices. The person that's suffering is you because you don't have the space that you are wishing for and envisioning. And so anybody that's being triggered by an old loss so important to do some healing work around that loss, like process it, talk about it, share it, write about it, see a therapist, do whatever you need to do to make that loss be, you know, have the light shined on it and, and gain some healing around it so that it does not continue to sabotage your life and your management of your life. Super important. All right, we are just about <clears throat> out of time, so I need you to give me the weekly tittle. Okay, the weekly tittle is entitled A Clearer Vision. This week's assignment is to create a vision for how decluttering and getting organized is going to benefit you. Reflect on the reasons you've decided to reduce the clutter in your space and or to get organized. Write down specific benefits that you expect to gain by completing your organizing projects. Um, if you have trouble getting started, you can try brainstorming some various ways to complete these sentences, like 
When I'm organized, I will be fill in the blank. When I'm organized, I will do fill in the blank. When I'm organized, I will have fill in the blank. For Anita, it is when I'm organized, I will have my friends come and dance in the studio in the basement. <laughs> and I can't wait to see a picture of that. I want to see the end result of that. Design a vision board to highlight the elements of your vision for your more organized life that you've expressed. You can take a piece of poster, construction paper, decorate it with your statements, add images from magazines and catalogs, um, anything that illustrates your goals and aspirations. And the idea here is just to focus on, yeah, organizing is this chore, decluttering is this chore, but there's benefit from it. And what benefit am I going to get out of it? What do I see as the positive end result of me doing this work? When I'm organized, I will fill in the blank. And focusing on that can help you see it in a more positive light and help you um, go back to organizing with a more um, supportive of yourself, a framework that's more supportive of yourself. We want you to be able to go for it and realize that you're the one that benefits from the effort. And this is how you can do it. Can't wait to hear. I really can't wait to get the picture of the dance studio someday. And <laughs> we will look forward to that. Someday soon. Right? If you're watching this on YouTube, we would love for you to join us live. To get notifications about upcoming events, we invite you to join the meetup group by visiting cfhou.com slash meetup. You can also follow us on Facebook by visiting cfhou.com slash Facebook or join our mailing list list by visiting cfhou.com slash subscribe. We love to hear from you, so please keep your questions, comments, and topic suggestions coming on YouTube, Facebook, or anywhere that you find us. You can always reach us through our website at clutterfairhouston.com. Thanks, everybody, for joining us today. We really appreciate it, and I'm so thankful that the weather did not knock us off the air. That's awesome, and I hope you have a great day, and we'll see you next week. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.